So whether they're like coming to me and like comments on social media, thank you guys for letting us know, by the way, um, whether they're like, or I'm just scrolling through social media and I'm seeing comments, people are still so confused. They're like, wait, but my vet says don't feed grain free food, right? Like yeah. I see this constantly. I'm sure you do too. Yes. And so, so it doesn't matter how much we talk about it. It's like, we just got to keep talking about it. I know. Because <laughs> people don't know. It's, I was working still at a retail store and we were like, I was the nutritionist there. So when this happened, it was insane. The amount of people who were like, so scared. We had a local vet hand out flyers that said, do not feed and what foods to feed. And they would come in and tell us like, we can't feed this anymore. We need to switch. Like, can you order us Purina? Can you order us Royal Canaan? Can you whatever? And it was, it went on forever for like months. And then it would, it was really weird because it would make this like resurgence like every year or every other year. And then people would come in again with these articles and I would be like, uh, it's 2022. Like the date on here is like 2019. Yeah. Like what okay yeah. so yeah it's literally something that i feel like never goes to bed like it will never um just because people will look things up especially when their dog gets diagnosed with dcm you go and you research and then those are the things that come up so then you think like oh my gosh like this is active this is current and then it just starts all over again so yeah um but yeah it was definitely back when that first came out it was wild yeah, well, I mean, still today, a lot of veterinarians, like Western med veterinarians in particular, are still like touting don't yeah. bring free food. Yeah. So it's it's persisted um, yes. with veterinarians, and it's not surprising, especially since. So I don't think we can talk about this without talking about the lawsuit that that was filed this year, but I think it was this year, um, but. So DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. Yes. It is where the heart um, enlarges, mm -hmm. kind of thins out. I'm, I'm, para I'm kind of just trying to simplify <laughs> it. Like it, it yeah. like the the walls become thin, um, and then it's just it decreases the function of yeah. the heart. Basically. Yeah, the heart has to. It's when you have the muscle like the, it's the largest chamber and that muscle is typically pretty thick and it's, you're gonna have that like the thickest um mm -hmm. wall there and that can become stretched and thinned out um, that can be due to a blockage in an artery it can be just genetic i mean there's different reasons why um you know that may be like a a, a stretch there in that um ventricle and then you the heart does not have the strength to push the blood through uh, because of the thinning of the muscle and so it's a huge struggle and so the heart becomes enlarged because it's like trying to really hard to like push the blood i guess that's like a representation of that <laughs> chamber there um but yeah and even if you have a blockage in an artery like the heart has to pump so hard to try to get the blood past that so you're just really wearing down that muscle so um yeah i mean it's pretty like wild and i feel like in certain dogs i that i know that had it that i was like helping that i had clients um some dogs had like a really like deep and large chest like mm -hmm. there's more room needed for that heart to be you know sitting in that chest um but but yeah that's yeah dcm is just like the thinning and then the lack of ability to really pump strongly through yeah. through you know pumping blood strongly through the body yeah and so i know so there are some breeds that are kind of known to be predisposed yeah. to this so it's not always caused by food but it can be they're saying it can be caused by food by nutrient deficiencies and i think that's where it gets really, really confusing for people. So, um, 
the symptoms of it, and I think one of the biggest symptoms that and people aren't really aware that because they think coughing seems to be one of the biggest symptoms, right? Yeah. At least initially. And so people aren't really aware that that can be indicative of heart yeah. problems. Yeah. And so they go in going, okay, what's wrong with my dog's lungs? But mm -hmm. they're like, all right there in the same place. And when the heart yeah. is enlarged, it's it's gonna put pressure and, mm -hmm. and reduce the space that the lungs have yeah. to fill yes. with, with air and, and um, expand. So that is one of the biggest things I think people take their pets in for. Like, okay, my dog will not stop coughing. And they think it's like, oh, they have a cold or old, like they have bronchitis or pneumonia or something. Yeah. Um, but what we have found and what, I know, so originally, I think it was 2018, they st started saying that um, grain-free foods were causing nutrient deficiencies and leading to DCM in dogs. Mm -hmm. And they said at the time, even the FDA said that there were increased reported cases of DCM and dogs. Mm -hmm. Looking back, we're now six years away from that. Which is um, insane. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? Alex Bertolino says that's how we found out it was so hard. He was 14. Thanks for, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. It, it is tough. Like, it's scary. That's scary to me. I, I mean, I get it. I totally understand. And I feel like if something happened to my dog, like, I don't care what it is. If something happened to my dog, I'm going to be telling everybody about it anyway. Yeah. So I get it, like, why this spreads. Um, but the, the lawsuit that, I'm going to pull it up because I don't want to get this wrong because Lord have mercy if we get something wrong, right? Um, the lawsuit that Keto Naturals filed against, it's, it's a class action, but interestingly, they're the only ones named on it. Um, they, they filed it, it was this year, February of this year against Hills. Mm -hmm. And basically like in a nutshell, I want to kind of get your opinion on this. So in a nutshell, they're saying that Hills along with some named veterinarians, which I think is fairly unusual for a mm -hmm. lawsuit like this. They actually named certain veterinarians in it, um, as like co-conspirators for creating this hoax is what they're calling it. Mm -hmm. Um, that they, they, Hills had lost market share specifically to Blue Buffalo mm -hmm. and the grain-free diets that Blue Buffalo had out. Mm -hmm. And so they created this like hoax is what they're saying. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's true. Um, that scared everybody and told every veterinarian in the country to tell people to stop feeding grain-free diets and somewhat successfully they regained their market, a, a lot of their market share yeah. after doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so what is, what is your thoughts? I know initially they were saying um, it was the legumes, yeah. right? Because tell, like kibble needs some sort of binder. Tell me about that. Yeah, so <laughs> I just want to preface this, which Alex, I see your question. We will get to the conversation about diet and I think I'm assuming um, what you can do to help your pet and best, in, in our opinion, best uh, feeding practices. But um, <laughs> I just want to preface this with, uh, I have a master's degree in animal nutrition. I've been in the space for over 10 years and I get very spicy about this. So all of these things that are coming out of my mouth are opinions and uh, also just in my own experience of working with customers and generally just knowing about food um, and nutrients in food. So um, take that for what you will, but I'm not a veterinarian and, um, but I have since the beginning had this very strong opinion about this situation. And um, in regards to the, the, the situation with Hills and the lawsuit and everything, I think that in general, no matter what they're calling it, if it's a hoax or whatever it is, in general, the frustrating part of it all, in my opinion, is that there is information being shared by these huge companies that have so much influence over um, our pets and 
and people in this country that are supposed to help keep our pets healthy. Um, that paired with the lack of a uh, holistic education in vet school um, is really, really dangerous and very scary because pet parents are hearing this information from people who they trust. And um, in my opinion, there wasn't even research done. It was just a claim that was put out. If we're looking at the study that was done, there was like maybe 570 to 700 dogs that were in this study, which is nothing compared to the millions of dogs. Um, <laughs> This is, I'm sorry, this is my mom's, this is a family member and she's okay. speaking German because it's she's German. trying to focus. <laughs> um, she said, I'm trying to uh, concentrate. Uh, I'm not, my English is English not that is good. good. Yeah. Okay, I'll explain it uh, to you later too. Um, but I think that the spread of this information with such a minimal study, it's not even a study, it's a report. So the, what happened originally is that there was the DCM was reported in this this quantity of dogs. I don't think, I think it was at the time 565. It was not that many dogs um, all across the country. Um, that is not a big number of dogs. And the food that they were being fed was anything from kibble through raw food. Um, and so even dogs that were fed raw, which if you look at, if there's multiple parts to this, uh, but if you look at food and, um, and it's like breakdown, really a raw fed dog with the proper nutrient delivery should not be having this issue. So that to me, makes me think it's caused by something else. But the claim that legumes um, and grain free foods are um, causing DCM to me makes no sense because yes, some of them may interfere with nutrient absorption in the body, but if you have the proper um, proper amino acid building blocks in some instances, your your body can produce certain things. Taurine is one of the essential amino acids that have to be provided through diet. And they are saying that um, grain-free foods and legumes are interfering with taurine absorption. That may be true on a minimal level. However, taurine is extremely heat intolerant. So 70% of taurine gets destroyed during food processing. We are cooking these dog foods at 400 degrees, most of them. So there's a very low chance that taurine would even survive that heat processing. Um, and uh, there is no taurine in plants. Taurine is found in muscle meats and highest actually in heart. So that's kind of funny. Like feeds like. And um, so to me, it was never a question of which dry food should we feed. It's never a question of grain free or grain friendly. It's a question of, is your dog designed to eat fresh food or a processed food? Uh, where are the best nutrients going to come from? And that was my theory from the beginning. I have always said, like, this is not a argument about grain free versus grain friendly. This is an argument about uh, what does your dog truly need and what is the best source for mm -hmm. your dog to get these nutrients. And so um, no matter the lawsuit later, I do think that this information was spread to cause a scare and it worked because many people um, switched off of, you know, higher quality foods at the time, like Acana and Origin. And um, I think at the time Zignature was really big too. Like, Foods that are boutique foods, or they called them like, I think, okay. foods, I think, like boutique, exotic, grain free, or something like that. Yeah. yeah, you have these huge companies that are coming out with these claims, and all of a sudden you have people who are like, oh my gosh, I better feed this food because they're claiming the other ones are not safe. And there's not really any evidence or research to it. And it took like over a year to get even any response from the FDA to be like, actually, just kidding. We didn't find any relation in, in this situation at all. So I don't even, even know if I answered your question, but no. <laughs> so many parts to it that I just, I, I do yeah. think that somebody should hold them accountable for just putting claims out there, scaring everyone, making veterinarians, even veterinarians who... I don't think necessarily that a lot of them are in on it. I think no. that they're just doing their best to try to save dogs and they are listening to the people who they learn from. And 
there's just not enough knowledge about fresh feeding and about um, the true needs of our dogs and cats. And so when you spread this type of information, of course, it's going to go wild, like haywire everywhere because there's just, you know, yeah. there's, there's fear. And then that's just what people do. Yeah. Well, for one, it, it kind of goes to show just how little nutrition plays a role in traditional, traditional veterinary medicine. Oh like God. they don't know it they don't and I, i'm not saying this to be mean or be like yeah. what they do I, I always feel it necessary to like kind of <laughs> qualify these statements with what they do is amazing and important mm -hmm. you know if your dog is hit by yeah. a car yes take them to the closest yeah. veterinary office um but they as you said don't really have holistic training unless they intentionally go out and seek it on their own. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's with like some sort of holistic club in a vet school or outside of vet school once they've graduated. And they're not very similarly to our human medical establishment. They're really not taught how important and foundational to health nutrition is. Yeah. And so they don't have the tools to rebut this yeah. kind of information when a huge corporation comes to them and says, here's what's happening. Trust us. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. And, but also like, if you look at a college curriculum, so like U of I, for example, I looked at their curriculum a couple of years ago at the time there was, I don't even know if there is now, I haven't looked at it in a while, but they, do not have nutrition on the curriculum. It is not existent. And if they do, it's maybe a semester. And then they are taught the diets that are already pre-made by these companies and how to feed them and how to recommend them. So they have their critical care. They have their urinary care. They have their liver, you know, care. They have all these different lines of food that this is what you recommend and here's why. And their prescription foods, they charge double the price for them but there's actually nothing prescription about them. There's nothing in them that is a med that is a medicine. And if you look at the ingredient profile, it is, we talk about how you shouldn't be feeding our dogs plant-based foods. All of these foods are plant-based. Mm -hmm. They have chicken meal as the first ingredient, and then they run into wheat, corn, soy, whatever byproduct. They are plant-based and our dogs genetically now with how we are breeding, it's tied to multiple things. It's not just our veterinarian, our vet schools, or these corporations that are controlling that. My dog has to go out. <laughs> it's also um, it's also the breeders and the genetics and the choices that pet parents are making of where they get their dogs and how these dogs are bred that we are running into more genetic conditions, which DCM, is in my opinion very much genetic depending on the breed you get and then we are feeding these foods that are uh, not supplying them with the proper nutrients uh, she's crazy not providing them with the proper nutrients so of course the body is going to respond that way that they the health of the dog is affected so much quicker and so much more extremely um, than if we were to feed a fresh diet. So I had a client that I've been working with for years with, she's had two dogs in the time that I've um, worked with her and known her. So the first dog was Ray and he's a Weimaraner and she gets him from a local breeder. And this woman does do, I don't know much about her breeding practices. Um, I do know that she has a lot of dogs and I do know that they're very popular in our area. So she got this dog um and she was feeding a mixture of dry and raw and we were working on toppers and we were doing multiple things so she was providing this dog with a dog. <laughs> that was my elbow dude um, <laughs> you want to take her she was providing this dog with multiple nutrients multiple things that were providing good nutrients for heart health and just general body health um this is a big dog he weighed 90 pounds um big big one we're on her and um he at the age of five they were playing ball in the backyard and he just dropped dead and um he had he was 
diagnosed with DCM, like probably a year before that, that maybe. And, um, but I, I look at that and I think, okay, well, what would his lifespan have been if she wouldn't have been doing the things that we were doing? And he didn't really struggle much. Like he ended up just passing away. And I mean, he had a very deep chest and he was a beautiful dog and very well behaved, got lots of exercise. He was extremely well taken care of and got lots of good food. And he died at the age of five and he could have, you know, probably lived to the age of 10 or 12 um, with how he was being taken care of. But in this instance, do we really think that this was diet related? Because this dog has eaten high quality dry food mixed with fresh raw food, lots of toppers like goat milk, kefir, um, you know, freeze dried treats, real like meat foods. Um, so is, is this really food related? or is this genetic? And so to me, that's something that's really important to look at. Like, I feel like there's a lot of things you can do with diet and there's a lot of influence you can have with diet. And I mean, we see, I see that every day, but I also see that with humans. Like I see, like our neighbor was diagnosed with cancer. She's 32. She's healthy. She eats the best foods. She's incredibly conscious of what she puts in her body and moving her body and she was going to go into chemo and she started things and she started making changes and before she went into chemo like she was drinking turkey tail tea every day she was grounding she was meditating she was just really focusing on what she put in her body she changed her diet to keto she shrunk her tumor to almost gone before she even went in she has one of the most aggressive cancers and like how do we look at processed foods and think this is what's going to be good for your body and i will die on that hill like i just think that we are in a time where there it needs to be a shift there needs to be a shift in what um students are taught in school and at least to give them the option to explore different things like everybody has different opinions everybody has different practices and you need everything because everyone has different wishes but you need to at least give them an exposure to these other paths and giving them like insight into holistic care and holistic medicine and herbalism in vet school in my opinion so that they can come up with their own philosophy on whether that or not that's something that they want to do but there is no money in that mm -hmm. because herbalism everything grows on the earth like there's you can make tinctures and you can make things out of them but everybody could literally grow those things themselves like everything that we need is already existing without the need of chemical intervention so every single medication on earth somehow has been derived from a plant but turned into something chemical so it has been provided God has provided everything that we need, but we are over here like trying to make as much money as we can and it's all connected. And I just, I don't know, I'm going on a rant, but I just like feel like this entire topic has put so much fear into people's heads and made them think that they have to go to a more processed food than yeah. actually going the opposite direction. Yeah. And well, what like, I know noticing is that people are so scared by even people that are like okay yes I'm on board I want to feed my dog a fresh food diet but my vet says my dog needs grains yes. and I even see that regularly and I'm like wait a second <laughs> wait a second like okay I would rather somebody feed a fresh food di food diet and include grains because they're scared like, just to put that out there, I would rather that happen than them continue feeding kibble. But I also want to educate people to where they understand that you can put your dog on a fresh food diet and not include grains and you're not harming them because they biologically have no need for yes. grains in their diet. The, like, when we can argue all day long, about nutrients that grains can and can't provide mm -hmm. but the reality is and the on the spectrum and I'm I've learned this from Dr. Billinghurst we go from herbivore like obligate obligate herbivores like a, a panda mm -hmm. or a koala or 
okay, yeah. to obligate carnivores, which are our feline species. Mm -hmm. And in between, you know, all the omnivores, but our dogs, as they exist today, mm -hmm. the scientific term would be a facultative carnivore because they can digest plants. Can survive. They can, yes, they can survive. So um, just to, because that's what we're talking about, Alex Bertolino says, um, our pets are obligate carnivores, correct. Our cats are obligate carnivores. Our dogs are technically facultative carnivores. Or mm -hmm. like scavenging. Yes, scavenging. Car yeah. yeah. So they can survive on plant matter, berries, seeds. They can in the if they were in the wild, right. they can survive and care, hold themselves over with plant matter. Mm -hmm. But they will actually hunt and eat big meals, and then they will not eat for a few days, and they will like kind of get by on other things. So yeah. they're kind of like scavenging around. But then cats need nothing else but meat like they are meat organs they i mean obviously nowadays they survive but there's yeah. also a reason why you know one out of three cats gets kidney disease by the, the age of 10. there's a reason for these issues because we are they lack moisture in their diet they are feeding highly processed foods it's just there's a reason why these lifespans are so much shorter um so i was gonna say something else and i forgot what it was but <laughs> I'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So like we have this spectrum and I think it was Dr. Connor Brady that said in his something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing that our dogs and our cats, like it's, it's amazing, what, truly amazing what their bodies can do to survive. Yeah with what we feed them but that doesn't mean that what we're feeding them is actually what they their bodies need yeah right like it's it's amazing how adaptive they are but that doesn't mean that we should force that adaptation yeah yeah so the one i, I remembered what i was gonna say and it falls in line so i typically will tell a customer or a client of mine if we want to split the bowl okay like you can feed raw and kibble together that's just I think that's great. Um, if you can feed some raw, I would rather you buy the lower qual like the lower uh, quality, lower price dry food and put your money into the freezer and buying fresh than feeding the highest quality dry food you can get and not adding anything to it because you are allowing the body to have like whatever, a quarter of the bowl rest. You're allowing the body to have a quarter or half a bowl of easier time to digest food and getting the hydration into the body. And I don't even care if you feed grain or grain free. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter because in the end, either food is highly processed and has filler ingredients that are gonna be hard on the body. Dry food has to be made with carbohydrates. There is no way around it because it would not be shelf stable otherwise. Like they can't make a keto type diet because the fat would turn rancid it's just not possible there's no way to keep it stable enough to to make it with less carbohydrates so every food is going to have at least 28 to 30 percent carbohydrates but the normal average is between 50 and 70 percent which is insane yeah and so that all just breaks down into sugar which causes more inflammation inflammation in the body more fat storage in the body so you have higher obesity rate you are just kind Insulin of resistant yes like causing so much more damage in the body by feeding these foods and honestly yes most grain-free foods especially if they contain like potato are going to be so high in a glycemic index because a potato is going to have a lot more sugar than barley so honestly if you have a dog that's obese if you have a dog that is has chronic inflammation pancreatitis sometimes i i believe that you can totally go to a grain friendly food and then add your fresh food to it just to reduce the sugar con content in the food. Um, but that being said, like either food, either uh, grain free or grain friendly is still going to be a highly processed diet. It's still going to be extremely strenuous on the body. It's still going to cause damage that is going to take a long time to repair. Um, so in my opinion, you're always better off just feeding a lower priced food and 
putting your money into the fresh food to give your dog a break or your cat. Um, I understand budgets are really hard. I am going through this right now. We, you know, spend like, I have four dogs and four cats. We spend like $600 a month on food. It's insane to me. <laughs> um, kind of just comes with the territory. Like I will not feed, you know, um, I just won't feed lower quality just because this is what I talk about. This is what I teach. And to me, I just have to like, you know, that's how I can observe my dogs the best. And, uh, but it's brutal. And so I totally understand it. You know, if you have three giant dogs, like how do you afford it? Like who can pay a thousand dollars a month for dog food? And so I do think that there should be no shame ever in trying to adjust to your budget and trying to figure out how you can make it work. And I just think, and a lot of it also goes into like, how are we treating our dogs at the vet? Are we going to the vet every year and vaccinating? Are we doing uh, chemical flea and tick treatments? Are we doing chemical heartworm treatments? Are we intervening, are intervening with antibiotics and steroids? What else are we doing to the body to weaken the body in, on top of feeding processed foods? It's a completely like, it's, it's this huge thing. And so one thing that I noticed was we had a customer that had a dog that got diagnosed with DCM. And they, of course, gave her the handout to say, these are the foods that you can feed. And it was like Purina, Hills, all grain friendly foods. And they said, and then they gave the dog a steroid. Um, and they said, you need to make a food switch. And then the customer was like, okay, well, my dog is better after a week. And the vet is literally saying it's food related. And I'm like, okay, hold on though. Let's backtrack. You put the dog on a steroid and then you switch the food. So yeah. which, which one is actually helping? Because you don't know. And to me, there's no way that the heart can just like bounce back with just a diet switch from one kibble to the other within one week. It just does no. not work no. because you're not actually putting usable nutrients in the body, no matter what kibble you feed. So that is not to shame anyone that feeds dry food. I totally understand that. Um, but the best thing you can do is to add fresh food that's usable by the body, muscle meats especially, into the bowl to give your dog usable nutrients that can target, that are building blocks for, you know, the heart and for the organs in the body to properly function. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think since we're talking so much about um, alternative foods, uh, I'm going to go to some of the comments and it'll kind of lead us in that direction. Um, NTA 33 says, I fed my seven pound toy schnauzer, a home cooked grain free diet, and she lived 15 and a half years. She was the sweetest, healthiest dog ever. That's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, Amy H71 says, Hi, new to this chat. Can you comment on the farmer's dog food? I have, I have thoughts. What are your thoughts? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, a couple things. I don't like to feed synthetic uh, vitamins and minerals. They're, you know, sometimes you companies do what they have to do. I understand that. Um, farmer's dog, my brother feeds farmer's dog to their, to their Frenchies and they've been doing great on it. Uh, his one dog has IVDD, which is inner vertebral uh, disc disease. So he's paralyzed from like mid back down. And he has been since, he has been for like five years and he's doing great, but he does really well on that food. It's the only food he does well on. So it is what it is you know <laughs> like you find what works and it works yeah um however i do feel like it is a very high carb high starch food even for being gently cooked and like fresh so i do think that there's some better alternatives if it works for your dog it works for your dog um but um i, I do think that they exploded really well on like a good marketing budget and that's great but and i, I okay i need to say this though I love that there are foods out there that have, it, it has educated a lot of pet parents on the effects of fresh food and what real food can do. So I do think it's going to be a better option than feeding a dry food. So I will say that. Um, so if you are feeding a dry food and it's something that you feel like fits in your budget and you wanna consider it, that's great. There are lots of cooked food options that you can look into, ever more pet food, goodness gracious, um, Sundays is like an air dried food. There's definitely other things you can look at 
and just kind of compare budgets. Um, but I do think that coming off of a dry food and if that's all you fed and um, you're wanting to do farmer's dog, I, in my opinion, it's going to be a better option than any dry food. Yeah. So that's my perspective. I don't know what yours is. But. Yeah, no, I'm, I think I completely agree with all of that. Um, very high carbs, starchy carbs. But if you're going from a kid, like it, they have done an excellent job, like you said, of marketing mm -hmm. and showing people what feeding real food to dogs can do. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a lot of success with like success stories with people on it other than tr the transition and yeah. that's huge yeah. so i'm all for anybody out there helping people understand and make that transition from a kibble to a fresh food um i also think there's a difference in using a synthetic vitamin and mineral pack which i think i haven't looked at it lately but i think mm -hmm. that's what farmer's dog is doing versus a fresh food company that is using targeted mm -hmm. vitamin and minerals yes. to fill in the gaps. There is a, to me, that's a huge difference, mm -hmm. especially when we realize, and I know most, most pet parents don't realize this, but I think you and I know and understand that the bar that AFCO sets is set for kibble and it is not impossible but difficult mm -hmm. for fresh foods to meet it yeah. because it's not biologically appropriate, especially if you talk to somebody like Dr. Billinghurst. Um, but so looking and under being able to look at that ingredient label and understand that that paragraph of synthetic vitamins and minerals is, is a vitamin and mineral pack versus if you, you're looking at another mm -hmm. fresh food and yeah. you're only seeing like maybe two or three, they're, they're really trying to build the best fresh food diet they can. Yeah. And they're just having to add a couple of things in to mm -hmm. meet AFCO requirements. So that is something that I think, again, most people don't know or understand, yeah. but can also make a big difference in what you're feeding your dog yeah. or cat. And and I mean, it's, it's hard for a company to make something specific for every dog. Obviously every dog has different requirements and stuff, but, um, and there are gonna be sometimes certain things that are going to be synthetically made but there's i don't remember whose website it was i was just on a website trying to figure out um what other foods i could feed my dogs and um there was one website that literally broke down every single thing that they added into their food and i don't know if it was goodness gracious or evermore pet but one of those two was literally breaking down this is what this um like this is a source of calcium this is where we get it blah 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 blah. and like that's so transparent i love that um so there's definitely like businesses and companies that you can look for that you know break everything down for you that are trying to do it right and um it's just really cool to see and yes it can be really expensive but that's like i said where you could try to kind of find a price break in um mixing some things together um and and figuring that out i mean i made our food i would buy half a cow from like the um local farm where i get bones for our broth and i would buy half a cow and then i would make the food myself it's exhausting um but now we're at this point kind of where which is like unrelated to this conversation but i'm like do we have to go back to that uh to try to figure out to make our own food and you know it's just like I guess it just depends on what you want to do, you know, and how it works in your budget. And you and I both do like nutrition consultations. So if anybody is like, I kind of need input or I need help or I, you know, just get with one of us and see um, what, you know, what you can do. And I see, I think sometimes it just helps also verify that you are maybe already doing the right thing or, you know, there's other opportunities and stuff. But um, Amy, you asked about carnivore. Carnivore is a baked dry food. Um, they do not use synthetics. Um, they have different protein options and typically your local pet store can order them for you. Um, and, uh, this is just going to be like a more low heat processed food. Um, still dry food still has like, you know, plant matter, obviously. Um, but definitely a better choice than most of, of your highly processed dry foods. It's probably going to be the best dry food on the market also with a hefty price tag, but yeah. it just depends on you know, I what your budget is, everybody, everybody's budget is different. Yeah. And I think a lot of people aren't familiar with this brand and it was, I, I heard about the brand and kind of 
wrote it off. Mm -hmm. But this year, like literally like a month or two ago, Yum Wolf just came out with an air dried food that is 100% mm -hmm. synthetic free. Mm -hmm. And um, I interviewed Jaren Lucas, who owns Yum Wolf, on the podcast because of that. Like I didn't want to have him on prior um, because I just wasn't, it wasn't aligned mm -hmm. with what I, the information I put out. But having, you know, understanding that people are in all these different stages of awareness and what they're willing to do and mm -hmm. what they know about, what you know, having options out there for dry foods. And, and any, I, I just want to say, and I'm not saying this because <laughs> you're the one I'm talking to, but I don't care what dry food you're feeding. I know you've said, please add muscle meat, which is absolutely wonderful. But even before you do that, please add hydration to it. Like that is a hill yes. I will always be on. Um, I don't care what dry food it is. Please, even even if it's just filtered water. Oh my gosh, add I do all the time, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, I, and I'll be like at markets selling our broth or having conversations with clients if I'm having, you know, consultations or whatever. And I'm like, I understand the investment of broth, even a bottle of broth can be a lot for somebody like I, if it wasn't be if it wouldn't be what I make, I don't know that I would have it every day. Okay. <laughs> like, um, I have like unlimited access, but I always say that I said, even if you don't, if you, if you buy the broth and you want to use it one time, and then you're like, I don't want to buy it anymore. I can't then just do filtered water. And let your dog consume water with the food because the water molecules will attach and help bind the food already so that it's easier to absorb into the body. A dog, if he consumes four cups of dry food, needs a whole gallon of water. All of us here probably know how hard it is to drink a gallon of water in a day. I can't do it, okay? <laughs> like, it's so much. So a dog that's like half our size there's just no way. So you're going to have dehydration in the body. It's going to cause inflammation. What's, what's so crazy is inflammation requires water to be like balanced back out. So you are literally have inflammation in the gut and then you're pulling water from the cells and then you're dehydrating the body even more, which causes more inflammation. So you're pulling even more water. It's just this vicious cycle that you cannot get out of unless the dog is provided proper amount of moisture to digest food and drinking water is not the same it is completely separate um does not like some people will be like well my dog drinks a whole bowl of water after they eat their meal it will not be the same like it that drinking water is needed for a lot of other things in the body and food water is very very highly important so yes definitely agree with that always hydrate the bowl yeah so well, um, I don't know that we have time to get into the fever wrong recall that somebody brought up. Um, yeah. That's a whole, I think we could go on and on about that. Um, so suggestion, but they were asking for suggestions for um, alt raw food brands. Um, so what are, what are, what are some of the, and again, every dog is an individual. So what I might feed my dog is maybe not what I would recommend you feed your dog. I don't know. I don't know your dog. I don't know like what specific issues they have. Do we need to use food as medicine? Can we, or are we bringing in stuff? Like there's, there's so much to that. Yeah. I'm not a supplement person to begin with. Like I do as much as I possibly think I can do with food before I ever look at at adding supplements to a dog, but what are some of your like go-to brands that, that you do like to recommend? Um, <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna be fully transparent. I have been feeding Viva Raw for a long time and I have, I, I've loved what they do, their sourcing, their everything from start to finish. So this is like a really hard phase right now for me because I am also a manufacturer, so I can understand um, and feel for them what they're going through. So it's kind of hard. I'm still feeding it. I'm feeding what I have. Um, 
I don't have any of the batches, any of that batch that they talked about. Um, and my dogs have been okay. Um, but that being said, I do want to explore like what other options I have. And I have been feeling like I did a animal biome test on one of my dogs because he had struggled with diarrhea a few months ago, like for like a whole month, a whole month and we couldn't get it under control. And the animal biome test, he had like an outrageous amount of bacteria in his gut for one specific strand, um, that is, um, that you can just kind of like diminish and kind of lower with feeding proper amounts of fiber. And this dog hates vegetables. He hates fruit. He literally will leave it in the bowl. I have to hide it. It's exhausting. So um, he, I think is going to do better on a gently cooked food anyway, um, just to kind of help his body not have such an intense amount of bacteria coming in. Um, so I don't really know what we're going to do. Um, I have fed OC raw for, a long time before I got onto Viva and I still sometimes feed it now. It is one of the foods that is also um, very limitedly processed. It, when you look at it, you can tell it's real food. Um, so that has been okay. I don't necessarily know how thorough they are in their, pro in their sourcing. I don't think that they necessarily focus on grass fed, grass finished, pasture raised. I don't necessarily know. I I know that they are like produced i don't know it was california i don't know if they've moved now or maybe arizona but um so that is what i fed for a long time and my dogs did fine on it um they have a good variety of proteins um that is my extent of the foods that i have like trust my dogs with i know that there's a lot of other foods however i have tried my dogs on hpp foods I do want to try the green juju. I have not tried it and I know that they do HPP um, and I don't know how my dogs would do on that, but I have not tried HPP in 10 years because the first time I tried HPP, my dogs were puking everywhere. So um, it, like I said, it, like you said, it depends on your dog. You know, some dogs did really, really well on originally when Primal was like the only raw mm -hmm. food. Um, a lot of dogs did really great on it and that's, you know, what worked. And um, any HPP that I've tried with my dogs, even Steve's or Northwest Naturals or anything, it just never really worked. So I know Almas Pride actually didn't know this till yesterday, um, but they use uh, bacteriophages, which are um, viruses that are targeted to eat specific bacteria that come up. So um, Almas Pride is, some, is definitely a brand that I want to look into um, because I think that's like a really cool approach um and their sourcing is really great and they just kind of popped up out of nowhere um at least to me <laughs> yeah in the last six months I'm, it's crazy because apparently they've been around since like the 80s and i just found them like this year too um i think that they have like base blends that are like 80 10 10 kind mm -hmm. of yeah they're obviously not afco complete and balanced but yeah. they're complete and balanced they do use synthetics for mm -hmm. um, currently but yeah who knows in the future it's What's so hard because i do think that for the, these companies who are trying to make a difference um in doing it things differently there's you know there's a zero percent tolerance for yeah. like any contamination through the fda which is hilarious because it's so much stricter yeah. for our dogs than it is for humans yeah. it's it cracks me up and our dogs are much more uh able to process things a lot better without there being much impact um but it's sad because these i don't necessarily think that like i think i think people get really frustrated and really upset but we also have to remember that these companies produce their foods in certain facilities and we have to remember that these brands are not, not on a mission to try to hurt dogs like yeah things that happen and I do think that transparency is key and if you trust this coming from a manufacturer myself you have to trust your your customers that they support you no matter what and I think transparency is the most important thing and you have to trust them with the information that you share and you have to be open about it and that's the thing that people want nowadays you want to be able to know what well how are you sourcing if anything comes up, are you telling us the truth? Are you um, sharing it as soon as you know? And so 
it's hard to see, but I also understand where people who feed their dogs, they want to make sure that they are not hurting their dogs. That's the whole reason they're spending this much money on, yeah. you know, the food that they feed. So I don't know all this to say, there's a lot of things out there and a lot of foods out there. And I have to do some serious digging to try to figure out a different type of protocol. I have, um, you know, I'm not necessarily scared of this situation with Viva. I'm not scared of the potential bacteria issue. Like I don't, my dog eats, you know, dead birds and stuff. So I <laughs> like, well, I, that's not to say that it can't harm dogs and that it hasn't harmed dogs. And I respect all of that. I just think you have to use discernment and you have to know yourself what works for you. And, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of different options and, um, but nothing's going to be perfect. And I think that there's, I definitely always feed the food, but I always add other things. Like we use spirulina, we use um, PEA, we use uh, pumpkin. We are adding, like, we add fish to the meal. We use sardines. We are doing kefir. We add so many other things to the bowl on top of, of already buying high quality raw food. <laughs> um, so I think that that's, kind of how I maximize the nutrients that my dogs consume um and it's up to everybody for themselves I think it's hard to say and I feel like it's also hard to kind of average it out across all these dogs and pet parents because each dog has different requirements and has different needs and has different gut strength and um so I definitely I don't know I can't even give you a list, honestly, of foods that I that I um, would recommend just because it's like so specific. But um, I definitely always look at the ingredients. Look at your look at um, how, how many synthetic vitamins and minerals are in there. If there's like five lines of different ingredients, it's maybe not the best. You know, try to find foods that have the most minimal ingredients. Um, and I do think that Green Juju does really, really good. Like they source amazingly. They have a very unique ingredient profile mm -hmm. and it's all trial and error. It, you yeah. may think this is great and it does not work for your dog. Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. trial and error. So I don't know. That's a whole yeah. thing. But. Well, and I had, um, interestingly, my dog didn't do well in a lot of HPP products either. Um, and, but it wasn't the same experience you had. I tried Steve's and I don't even think I got to Northwest Naturals. She just, I'm telling you this girl, cause she has been raw fed since I adopted her at two and I have never seen this girl poop so much. I mean, literally uh, like all day long and huge. Well, poop. And they oh, have God. chia seeds <laughs> in their, in their food, I think. So that, that'll get you right there. So, um, I'm like, okay. And I really didn't try much, but she does. I will say she, so I also have been a feeder of Viva Raw and she just this year kind of got to the point where she was like refusing it and not eating it. And, um, but she would eat ever more. So I, uh, was like, okay, well let's, I would just kind of really lightly heat up the Viva on the stovetop with, you know, some liquid in the pan and, um, she would then eat it. So I'm like, okay, maybe, yeah. maybe I'm getting to the point where you want a gently cooked food. I don't know. But then I was able to get the green juju frozen, mm -hmm. um, raw and she eats, she absolutely loved it, loves it. She, um, does still poop a little bit more. Mm -hmm. then I, I, I mean, it's not as bad as it was with Steve yeah. or, or with Evermore. Um, she poops a lot on Evermore. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, I mean, that's like typically, you know, I do think that typically gently cooked foods for the most part are going to have more filler ingredients. Um, yeah. and I, I don't know what the reason is for that. I wonder if it's like when you cook things, you know, it kind of loses its volume. So just to kind of mm -hmm. fill that void there a little bit i i don't really know but that's not to say that it's not good for your dog so right. i looked at evermore um kind of got scared of the price honestly but <laughs> um but yeah i don't really know what i'm gonna do i'm still feeding Viva for now and mm -hmm. um 
I am going to try like almost pride, I think, and we'll just see how that does. And then I know I have to, um, I'm going to try your green juju. And then, um, I'm also looking into like other gently cooked foods just cause yeah, stone mm -hmm. is the same way. He would eat the Viva much rather eat it cooked than mm -hmm. raw. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I just bought some solutions to try, mm -hmm. um, cause they yeah. ferment for their mm -hmm. pill stuff or whatever. Um, but yeah, I do, do, I guess since it, we, 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 we are kind of talking, like I, I get the one thing I want to say about this Viva recall that I haven't said is that we need these small pet food manufacturers. We need them because the big guys aren't making food in my opinion that is appropriate to feed our animals that is feeding them to thrive it's not that's not what's happening yeah. we need these small manufacturers we need people who care yeah. about sourcing who care about the product that they're putting out and for small companies to survive to build a small company the reality is there are a lot of third-party vendors involved yeah and while no you absolutely cannot control what happens in a facility that you don't run own manage you can't you can't look be looking over everybody's shoulder all day long every day to say no you need to be pulling from that stack and not this stack right that happens still as the brand owner, you're accountable for whatever they do. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they are not accountable for it. They absolutely are. But I think it's important for us, especially like in the healthy pet space, we're still really small. Like the percent, percentage wise of pets and pet owners who are feeding fresh food to their dogs is still really, really small. And so, it is completely up to you as a pet parent listening or watching to make the best decisions for your pets. And if you feel like you've lost trust, that is how you feel. I'm not trying to sway you one way or the other. I just think that we need, we need to understand that there are growing pains and that it's not always in our best interest in the long run to just give up in the early stages when a company is trying to grow. I truly believe that Viva is trying to do things the right way. And yeah. most people have never owned or run a business, so they don't understand the behind the scenes of all the things. Again, they are still accountable for what their third party vendors do, but I also think we have to give them some leeway and say okay this was a mistake you have made changes you've told us what these changes are going to be in your processes blah 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 like i think that's important too yeah so that's my two cents <laughs> yeah i being like i said being a manufacturer of our bone broth i've been through this i have we have had and i'm sure it'll happen again we have had um bottles that went bad unexpectedly, um, unexplained. I can't explain to you why that happens. Um, we have learned a lot throughout the process. We're turning five next month, like, and we learn. And the biggest thing I think is just being transparent and trusting that the people who feed our product are going to be accepting and respectful. And there's going to be people who are not. And I can see how it's scary to announce to the world that, that you had this issue when people trust your food, you know, but all you can try to do is announce it um, and make sure you announce it first and that you yeah. are the one who shares the message. And I think that's yeah. what's frustrating for people when they find it out from other people first. And um, we don't know exactly the reason why, um, why they're in this position. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I also know, that yes, they are manufacturing not in their own space. Um, mm -hmm. This out 
break specifically is something that can come from anything. This can come from whatever they put in their food could be, could have been, you know, come from a different place that was contaminated. They had no idea. Um, I don't know. You can just learn from it and try to make it better. And it's, yeah, it is really frustrating to think that, you know, um, they lose their support and potentially won't be able to make it through it. And they do, I do think think that they have been in it for the right reasons and I do think that they have been in it to make the best product on the market and this is unfortunately a situation that broke the trust of a lot of people and so I feel for them and I do hope that they can come out of it and I hope that they can make a better product um but yeah I don't know it's hard to say it's um I, I hurt both ways, so I, I get it. Like I feed it, I'm a customer, but I'm also a manufacturer. So for me, it's it. I I feel it on both sides, and I have a hard time also. So if anybody watching has a hard time with it, um, and doesn't really know what to do, like you're not alone. Like um, it can be hard, but uh, but yeah. Um, uh, somebody else said, um, "C mad, C mad sr." I don't know if I'm saying that right. My dog will need not eat food when I hydrate it with broth or water. Any suggestions? Um, you can try to offer like broth as an appetizer instead. If you already have, so you're, I'm assuming you're feeding a dry food. Um, and I think somebody replied and said, just to start with very little, small amounts, that's a great way to start. Um, you can also try to do like freeze dried with that's already soaked in broth so that you don't have just the liquid. So you're getting some type of, rehydrated food in um yeah that's a tough one but yeah small amounts is a great great recommendation um and uh but yeah freeze dried is also also always an option yeah. um and then the other thing that i wanted to say is you you can do a lot of things like you can buy like freeze dried hearts you can do things that are um not bowl related like you can buy freeze-dried hearts you can feed sardines you can um, feed broth you can feed goat milk um, hearts are going to have your highest amount of taurine to protect the heart so let's roll back to dcm you know but yeah. <laughs> um, like feeds like so organs are going to have like muscle meat and organs are going to have a lot of taurine so um, that's the best thing to add to the bowl to try to get these nutrients into your dog so um, i definitely think think that um that's some of the best things you can do and yeah like get your dog checked like a lot of times you know dogs will get dcm and they think it happened because they were feeding the certain food when really this dog has had this condition since the beginning mm -hmm. so start getting tests at, uh, at the age of one and look at the heart and have them ultrasound it and see how it's doing and they can figure this out beforehand and then you know, okay, my dog is genetically predisposed to this condition. I need to really focus on strengthening the heart. And I mean, there's, there is like Herb Smith makes a taurine supplement. There's supplements you can feed, but nothing is going to be as powerful as actual fresh food. And you can find um, raw hearts. I think OC Raw actually just came out with a whole raw line of hearts and all these different things. Um, you can go to your local butcher and pick up a beef heart and cut it up and feed it to your dog fresh. Um, there's all kinds of different things you can do to try to um, improve the health of your dog. But the one thing that I would definitely recommend if you have a dog, especially a large breed dog, get their heart scanned straight from the get go. When you go to your one year checkup and get their heart checked. And then I definitely recommend going more holistic approach. Do not try to over vaccinate your dog. Do tighter tests. Not everybody does that. Find a vet who will. Um, everybody has access to that there's no reason why somebody can't do that type of testing um so if they're not willing then you find somebody who will and you have to advocate for your dog like i have not vaccinated my dogs in like seven years and their titers are still normal so that tells you something and um i just that interesting thing about that i did a podcast with dr Lori kosher about titer testing and she said that she's had multiple instances in her career as a veterinarian where she has come into contact with a rabid animal uh -huh. and um what's interesting is that they will accept a titer for her for anybody in the vet staff 
that was exposed, they will accept a titer from a human in those instances, but they act like they don't know what they are when we talk about animals. <laughs> Wait, what? Like, so what? like if, if you're exposed to a rabid animal in a veterinary oh. setting, they are required to booster their rabies vaccine or they can titer test oh. to see if they have immunity as a human, as a veterinarian or a vet tech or something like that. But, and so they know this as far as like they are concerned as humans, but then they act like they don't know what it is when you ask them for it about your animals. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not cheap. Like I just did a rabies yeah. tiger on my one dog who has not had uh, rabies vaccines since he was like a puppy. And it came back undetectable, um, like under the range that they want. But I was like, okay, well, I know he has had them so i know he's had the vaccine so i know he has the antibodies maybe not yeah. what the city wants to see but i know that he has them so <sighs> the whole, whole thing is just crazy but i definitely recommend a holistic approach on your dog um there's books you can read uh dr judy has needles to natural like like there's different things you can look at but if you have a dog that has a predisposed con condition an autoimmune disease the last thing that i would ever recommend that to you is to go and get vaccinated every single year to do flea and tick meds to do heartworm meds those things are highly toxic and inflammatory for the body and you have to f try to find somebody who's going to have a holistic approach and understand that that is not the best approach in those situations and so that makes a big difference because you can actually like speed up the decline of your dog by doing all those things mm -hmm. um so yeah um so yeah yeah, anybody out there who still thinks that um, grains are a requirement for dogs, I would just say there there are so many veterinarians that you can follow online. You just mentioned Dr. Judy Morgan, Dr. Katie Woodley um, are two that are like top of mind for me. But I mean, there are lots of others and it's it's not true. I, I do believe and, and it's it's the the lawsuit that Keto Pet Naturals filed this year against Hills, I think is very, very telling because I don't think a lawyer is going to put all of it, like they're not gonna give you all of their best information, right? Yeah. Like in, in a filing document and everything they put in the filing document is like mind blowing, like, wow, are you kidding me? Like, and you're not gonna put it in there if you can't prove it. Mm. So to me, it's very, very telling um that they have a lot of really damning information that i think i wish i wish the mainstream media would report on it but no no such luck. Uh, i mean probably when it's done then probably hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. We'll yeah we'll see but, um this last question uh martyr 4691 um if you're only feeding a chicken only feeding chicken i highly recommend booking a consultation because that is going to not be um not be enough for your dog to consume that is not going to provide enough nutrients your dog will have lots of deficiencies very quickly so please get on a call with one of us um book a consultation to try to figure out how we can help your dog there's lots of holistic help to help with pancreatitis um i definitely would highly recommend fresh food for that or even gently cooked so mm -hmm. um but definitely would recommend booking consultation that's like a whole another conversation in itself so I um, just wanted to say that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So much more than we could say yeah. here, I think. Um, but yeah, and I'm sorry that they're so thin. That makes me so sad. But yeah, they may probably are not getting all the nutrients they need yeah. from a chicken only diet. Um, yeah, so I think, I <laughs> hope, I hope this is the last, no, I know this won't be the last time we'll have to talk about DCM, but thank you for joining me. <laughs> and yeah, really. It. Anytime. I mean, and anybody who has more questions or any concerns, please send them to us because it's always fun to like see what people want to know about. And then we can always base another video off of that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yeah, just reach out to either of us and we are happy to hop on and do another one. I think you had a couple other topics that we were going to talk about. So um, yeah. I think we could go on and on oh. about these. Oh so I know. I know there's so much there's so much misinformation out there and honestly even in a lot of more holistically minded like facebook groups and stuff there's 
so much and, and people mean well but there's just there's so much uh, assumption yeah. that's happening and, and i know we've said this a couple of times already in the past hour but like every animal is an individual and don't take anything you find on social media at face value for your specific animal yeah. um, please <laughs> yeah i mean there's things that you can like pick up on an ad you know but yeah. Yeah, if the one biggest thing that I actually said this on the BK Pets podcast, and it was pretty funny because I was like, have you ever thought about this? So when your dog is sick and your dog has diarrhea or digestive upset and you go to the vet, they will tell you feed real food, right? They'll tell you feed chicken and rice. I'm not into that, but that's what they tell you. So I said, how come that when your dog is sick, the remedy is the fresh food, is real food? And then- yeah recommend to go back onto their processed food that to me is like just tells you right there that we know what heals the body we know what the body needs yeah so then, yeah then why are we feeding something that will get the body to that point where it needs real food but then we go back on the processed food it's just like if real food he heals the body in a time of need in a time of inflammation a time of stress why would we not feed that all the time yeah to a well, our, that. yeah, our medical system and our veterinary medical system is not that it, it's, there's nothing preventative about it, right? It's yeah. all very reactive. Um, it's not set up. It's not a health, none of it is a healthcare system. It's all a sick care system. And I think that's one of the biggest like paradigm shifts that we all need to make. And I think everybody, all of us in the healthy pet space, I think have made that paradigm shift, but you know, we just want more people to come over to yeah. come over. It's, to the same, it's the same for humans. It's mm -hmm. big pharma and big food are all together. They, they all, they're all up in one bed together trying to, <laughs> they want us to be sick because that's where the money is. You, like, like, why, why is the food and drug administration, why are food and drugs in the same administration? Yes. And <laughs> There are literally people that have worked for Big Pharma who know all of these connections. And we, I'm from Europe, so like we don't have these huge issues over there. We don't have all these, our grocery stores are tiny. We don't have all of these processed foods. We don't have all of these low fat, light options. We have real food that has fats, that is whole, that is properly made. And you don't really find a lot of processed foods here like you literally i mean a kroger is giant and there's so many options and you think you are feeding yourself well and you're eating a healthy diet by consuming like diet sodas and light yogurt and reduced milk and all these things and all that it is it's chemicals and sugars that replace the natural nutrients and it causes inflammation in the body and then you get sick and you have to go to the doctor and you buy medication and then you continue to feed yourself the same way because they say everything's fine you're doing great and then you still have to buy the meds because you never fix your body it's ah like it <laughs> drives me crazy and I'm the same thing we are you go every year to get your dog vaccinated why they don't need it. Their body has immunity. I was vaccinated as a baby for things that I don't need vaccinated for again. Your, your body knows, your body has memory. Mm -hmm. And like, I know. Why, do we, <laughs> why do we have to do this? Because you pay $200 every year to go get your dog vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And- It's like the most unscientific thing ever. Oh, it's so unscientific. I know. I know. I think we could go on forever, but I think I've also taken you away from your packaging for too long. <laughs> it's okay. I, I'm like, I feel like I'm just like not making headway. So this is a lot more fun, but you'll get it done. You <sighs> do it done. So guys, if you look, if you haven't tried um, crude carnivore bone broth for your pets, I highly recommend you do so. Um, it's, uh, Flo was on the podcast. If you haven't listened to that episode, please go check it out. Um, the Pet Parenting Reset on all of the major podcast apps. It's also on YouTube and, um, at thepetparentingreset.com. And we're, 
I know you do consultations. You've said that a few times. Where is it? Like, do you just do I, carnivore? No, to like just a mess. I, I have to get it set up. Like right now I'm just kind of like people reach out about it and I just tell them like my pricing and stuff. I don't have it like where I can, it can be scheduled, but I, there's been things that have happened like every other day where I'm like, okay, you really need to have a link. Um, so I'll probably get that figured out, but if anybody's interested, you know, just message me and that's how, um, that's how you kind of get connected with me and we can figure out what your needs are. But, um, that is what I ideally, I used to do that every day and I was, you know, doing consultations and things like that, but then I kind of got away from it with crude and then now I'm just like itching so hard to get back into it. So, um, but yeah, so just crude carnivore Instagram, just message me if, um, you know, if you have questions or if you want to book a call with me, um, and eventually I'll have a link at some point. I don't know <laughs> when I have time. <laughs> I know. I'm like, it would be so easy. Just create a product yeah. and then have that product, send an email to your calendar. Like you can do this. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I mean, I have the Calendly, like I just need to link it and stuff, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, one day. Um, right now I just hop on these lives and give my two cents and my sass and, um, yeah. <laughs> well, we all appreciate it. All of your knowledge, all of, um, your formal training knowledge and also, um, real world knowledge is yep. very appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't know. Well, I will get to see you in, or what you'll be in Williamsburg. Yes. So yeah, that's, that's next. Yay! Oh, I will get to see you there and we'll, I don't know, figure something else out. <laughs> we'll go from there for sure. Yeah, I can't wait. It'll be so it, fun. It, it will be. I'm so excited for it. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for asking all of your questions. As Flo said, if you have any um, questions, other topics that you'd like uh, to be covered, just DM either one of us. We're happy to talk about any and everything i think we both love talking and yeah. <laughs> yeah so have a i hope i hope you're prepared for the fourth tomorrow yes. um i'm sure fireworks will go well into the weekend i hope you're prepared and yeah People have, have, have them off, off for like a week and a half i'm like what are we doing um one tip that i have if you have never done this i am like i'm not going to be home tomorrow night um and we're going to like fireworks like in town but my dogs will be home and turn the TV on, turn the TV on national geographic on Disney plus. It's the best thing ever. Turn it on like l louder so that it kind of overpowers everything. And the fireworks don't sound as loud. I know some dogs are literally like terrified to like the bone. My dogs, only one of them gets kind of nervous about them. Everybody else is fine, but just turn the TV on if you're leaving town. Um, other than that, put your dog on a leash when you go outside. Oh my gosh. Do not Please. Put them on a put a harness on because they if they get scared enough they will run and people don't think that'll happen to them but I they will especially if they're scared yeah. so those are my two cents. All right, well, back to packing. Thank you so much, and you have somebody to translate all of this into German yeah. for. <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, I'm sure she can like listen to it over again, but um, yeah, she said also works for horses so. Um, I don't know exactly what she's talking about, but oh. uh, maybe the loud the TV thing. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the TV out to the barn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, that's a whole uh, different thing, like um, with horses and stuff. I I mean, I rode my whole life, but I don't know as much. Yeah. So um, it's got to be terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. So all right, cool. Well, Thank we you. can go on forever. So thanks for I having know. me on again. And uh, oh, she said music and TV works the same for horses. I was like, oh, okay, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> it is good to know. All right, we will All right. talk soon. Okay, bye. Bye.